over to you. I'm here, and I hope everyone uh, can hear me okay. Is, is my coming through all right? Yes, I believe so. Very good. Um, I want to um, thank Mark and Jill and the, everyone at uh, Livestock and Poultry Environmental Learning Center for this opportunity to meet with you and tell you a little bit about our work and about what I think is an exciting new market opportunity, a new revenue stream for uh, farmers in the United States and around the world. Global climate change, uh, as anybody who's uh, been looking at the scientific coverage and at the media coverage of this uh, topic knows it's a, it's a new world out there and a lot of uh, attention being paid uh, worldwide to this topic of global climate change. I'm not going to go into a lot of details about that right now, but really um, instead focus on how this has uh, created a new market. Uh, much of the world uh, through the uh, Yoto Protocol is involved now in a compliance marketplace uh, since 2005 when Russia joined on and ratified the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, the markets have developed. Uh, the systems are, are being put in place. Uh, people are learning a lot about the, um, uh, some of the mistakes that were made and, and are adjusting uh, things to make the market work better. Uh, we've got 169 countries participating through the UN uh, Convention on Climate Change. A couple of things to keep in mind about the Kyoto system, the one that operates worldwide. Over there, they talk about certified emission reductions, ERs, as opposed to carbon credits, so basically the same thing. Uh, one of the largest exchanges um, operates in Europe. The European Climate Exchange is a um, sister organization to the Chicago Climate Exchange. They're actually uh, owned by the same uh, company. Um, a couple other um, acronyms to be aware of. A joint implementation project in that framework is, is one that's done together by two countries that are uh, required to make reductions in emissions. The clean development mechanism is one that you'll hear a lot about. Uh, CDM projects are those projects that occur in developing countries, countries that are not required to make reductions under the treaty, but whose reductions can be um, turned into or, or verified as CERs, and then those uh, become valid in the compliance market for companies or industries in Europe to use for their compliance sake. The U.S. is a, a little bit different uh, because we did not join on to the Kyoto system after all. Uh, so we're in kind of an early action or a, a voluntary commitment framework where people are making voluntary commitments, either Chicago Climate Exchange or one of these other systems in California or in the northeastern United States. In the case of the Chicago Exchange, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but they make a voluntary commitment. but he, it becomes binding through their contract with other members. All of these are basically cap and trade systems, where the idea is that overall we want to cap emissions among certain industry groups. And uh, they may be energy or manufacturing or transportation sectors, but everyone operating within an industry group has to reduce their emissions against the cap. Uh, people who are regulated uh, emitters receive allowances uh, to um, emit, and then those allowances they either receive or have to auction for allowances, and those allowances go down year after year. The overall cap decreases each year. The trading uh, that's allowed, um, sometimes it's only a certain percentage of their allowance or their, or their clients can be achieved by using offsets or, or by trading. Um, that means that uh, entities that are not uh, regulated, uh, smaller typically, or they're, they're not in one of these sectors, if they can make emission reductions, uh, they can then, uh, and have those verified, they can sell those. Uh, that allows the market to find where are the lowest cost uh, emission reductions. Uh, one of the examples of this was in sulfur dioxide uh, reductions. Uh, acid rain was a giant problem two decades ago, and, and you don't really hear about it a lot anymore because they use a cap-and-trade system. They achieve their emission reductions ahead of schedule, 
and at half the cost of what had been predicted before the program started. Uh, in Europe, uh, there's a lot of trading going on. The market's growing faster than what was predicted. Um, uh, uh, 1.4 billion metric tons traded in 2007. Um, I think it was actually closer to a $65 billion market last year. Uh, in the U.S., uh, in 07, they traded about 23 million metric tons, or the effective uh, carbon credit. Uh, think about it in those terms. That was an 80% increase in demand. And in the future, they look at this market and the value of the carbon being traded as, as well over a trillion dollar market. The Chicago Climate Exchange is, is kind of the dominant player in the United States right now. It's a voluntary commitment, but it becomes legally binding for all the members who join. Uh, they typically are larger emitters, large manufacturers. They have to make reductions against a reduction schedule. And every year, they have to true up and verify their emissions against that schedule. This list shows you a variety of the members, but probably more importantly, the variety of the um, different industries involved right now in the CCX, along with uh, many counties, municipalities, uh, universities, and a variety of associate members who have joined uh, the exchange and are making reductions on a voluntary basis. Many people ask, why would a company do this? Why would they voluntarily take on a, a commitment that could cost them money? Well, many of them are getting pressure from shareholders, or they have corporate stewardship policies that require that they uh, do something about their environmental impacts. Uh, they might be getting uh, investment dollars from institutional investors that have similar policies. Uh, insurance companies and bankers are putting pressure on companies to manage their risk. And many of them see the risk, potentially, of um, so much as litigation. Uh, in Europe and, and elsewhere, even in the United States, there's been talk about uh, litigation on climate-related damage. So for many of them also, they have multinational uh, companies, uh, business activities, long-range planning, making investment decisions for, for 20 or 30 years. They're paying attention to this market. And by joining the exchange or, or getting involved in the market, they're getting practice and learning more about it. The CCX, uh, the United States, um, is actually a very large market now relative to other countries in the world. Um, just a few years ago, uh, the CCX was the second live market. It's actually gone now to become the largest uh, market in terms of the baseline emissions of all of their members. So if you add up all the emissions of the CCX members currently, their baseline emissions, it's larger than even Germany. A carbon credit is a, a, a financial instrument. It's a specific thing. It's documented in a verified reduction of a greenhouse gas emission. Uh, you can also create credits by increasing carbon sequestration in soil or in trees, for example. The carbon uh, Reduction, uh, the emission reduction or the addition of sequestration has to be above and beyond business as usual. Uh, so it can't be something that's regulated or required of, of somebody. In general terms, the measurement uh, is against carbon dioxide, which is the most prevalent greenhouse gas. So every carbon credit is equivalent to a metric ton of CO2, or it's equivalent in terms of other gases. The other gases can be. Um, quite much more significant in terms of their global warming potential. So in the case of methane gas, about 23 times greater. Uh, nitrous oxide, or N2O, is almost 300 times greater. There are several steps involved in creating carbon credits. First, we go through the process of delineating a, a project, uh, registering that project, developing a protocol for how we're going to measure and monitor and then verify the emission reduction or the increase in sequestration. And finally, go through a certification process, get the credits issued from the certifying body. And then our, one of our functions as an aggregator is to pull together credits from smaller projects and make larger pools for uh, buyers that are interested in, in getting larger supplies of carbon credits from a source. 
the credits that are available right now from the CCX, they've developed some standardized rules uh, for different types of offset projects. Uh, we work a lot in uh, terms of methane destruction, whether it's from landfills, uh, livestock production facilities, coal mine methane. Uh, there's also um, carbon credits available for increases in soil carbon, no-till or, or grass cover plantings. These tend to be in specific geographic areas where they have good data and good information about the uh, impacts of these practices. You can also get credits for rangeland soil carbon, forestry carbon, energy efficiency and fuel switching, and then a variety of other uh, uh, steps. One development that ECC has been leading is in terms of methane avoidance, uh, either from landfills particularly. Uh, so in the case of composting, specifically composting of food waste uh, that would have gone to landfills, uh, there are protocols that we've developed now for developing some credit opportunities in that way. You'll potentially see other kinds of credit opportunities as this market develops over time. The legislation that Susie referenced, uh, there are actually a number of bills being considered in Congress. Uh, the one she mentioned was the McCain uh, or Lieberman Warner bill that um, it's the first climate bill that's ever passed the Senate committee. Uh, it's now going to be considered on the Senate floor, I think roughly uh, the first part of June. This graph shows that the uh, projected impact of the different kinds of, of legislation being considered. And then this graph takes some of those same uh, cap and trade systems and looks at the potential impact on the value of carbon in the marketplace. As you can see, even the, the basic kinds of, of cap and trade programs would see carbon prices edge up to, to 10 or $20. Others uh, where the caps are more restrictive, you could see prices uh, in, the, in the European range of $30, $35. So how do you react to changing environments? Uh, whether it's an energy crisis or regulatory changes, these are things that farms deal with all the time. We, we see the key to success as being innovative, looking forward with vision, deploying new technologies. And really what we see is turning a, what others might see as a weakness, turn that into a strength. That's what we're about at uh, Environmental Carbon, uh, Environmental Credit Corp. Uh, we're looking to develop a large and reliable source of carbon credits for these new markets. Working with agriculture has been a, a big part of what we're doing. We're involved in other sectors as well, from biofuels to methane avoidance to energy from renewables. But the agriculture sector has been real important for us. Uh, more than two dozen projects under contract in, in at least 10 different states. Uh, we were the first to deliver a check uh, for carbon credits to a dairy producer from the CCX. Uh, we've uh, delivered the largest annual award so far, and, and we think we've got the largest market share for livestock ag methane credits. Our new program is designed to um, get going above and beyond what the, uh, what the digester industry has been able to uh, develop. Um, we think we can get to a lot of the other methane that's out there uh, through simple technology like lagoon covers. And in the case of our program, we'll actually pay for the lagoon cover installation uh, we own it, we insure it, uh, take care of all the major maintenance. We want to make sure that we're capturing the, the methane that's out there and turning that into credits for these new markets. At the same time, we share the annual payments, the value of the credits with the producer, and share in the biogas and, and any commercial use of the gas that can come from the project. Um, in general terms of carbon credits, this is the problem that we're solving. Open air lagoons, uh, liquid manure going into a, a storage facility or, or treatment lagoon is putting off methane gas as well as other odors. Uh, for the farmer, capturing those odors and reducing the odors is, is probably the biggest benefit to the farm, but there's also the benefits of using the biogas either um, for electricity or for heat. 
uh, around the farm. All we have to do, though, to make the carbon credit is to actually get rid of it and burn it um, even in a flare. We think this program uh, has a lot of value to farmers. It's a very simple uh, technology. It's well proven in many different industries. Uh, it's an add-on to existing infrastructure so we can keep the cost down all quickly. The farm gets other benefits like odor and pest reduction, a rainwater diversion, or even sand diversion for some farms is a big benefit uh, to their storage facilities. And there's an um, on-farm renewable energy source that, that comes from the project as well. Here's some slides to show, show you a typical installation. You can see the rolls of the cover material. It's a 60 mil high density polyethylene. But it, it seems very stiff, but at the same time, it, it, it comes in rolls just like carpet. The, uh, the installer uses special equipment to roll it out. They dig a trench around the lagoon so that uh, they have something to anchor the cover into. You can see in the bottom right there how they um, put sheets of fabric together on the side of the lagoon. They weld it um, using special equipment. They get a double seal on the weld. This shows you now how they've tucked the material into the anchor trench. They lay in some rock. They add concrete and then backfill with the soil. In the upper right there, you see um, uh, a system that we're adding to our projects. Uh, these are basically um, sludge removal pipes. Um, they're spaced about every 15 feet or so, um, maybe a little closer together at the point of the inlet in the lagoon. But the idea is that uh, by adding piping here, we can give the farmer a, a way to access the bottom layers of the lagoon to remove any sludge. Uh, in the lower left there, you can see the uh, sludge removal pipe um, exiting the cover and the way they weld around the cover to keep it all intact. Uh, the lower right there shows the cover in place. Uh, they use tubes of uh, sand and concrete to weight it down. Um, uh, one of our first uh, applications here was on a dairy farm in New York. Um, the farmer there um, looked at odor control and rainwater diversion as being his biggest benefits. Um, he likes the guaranteed income that comes from it as well. Um, here's a, a company that does all the work, uh, gets something out of it. Um, he found it very uh, beneficial. Quick review of some of the economics. Um, if you looked at a facility size of about 2,000 cows, our threshold right now can get as low as uh, about 1,000 cows. Uh, that's where the market is right now in terms of credit value, where you're seeing 4 to $7 in terms of uh, the value of credits. A typical milking cow uh, can generate upwards of about four credits per cow, but it, it could be more in some southern states, less in, in northern states. Um, you are limited by the baseline number of credits uh, depending on the sort of local conditions or what what the farm would have generated in terms of um, methane previously. In terms of the capital investment, the lagoon covers are um, relatively inexpensive, 100 to a couple hundred thousand dollars for a typical project. Uh, to use the gas on site requires some additional investment, but it, it compares pretty favorably to the cost of digesters right now. And in terms of operation and maintenance, it's really very simple. So it all becomes possible because ECC pulls together all these different players, the capital markets, uh, the investment dollars that we can gen uh, bring to the projects, working with a, a technology provider and, and working with all of our project partners here. And then we make the connection to the carbon credit buyers. And this particular program is supported in large part by American Electric Power, which has agreed to pre-purchase a significant number of the credits from this program. They're responsible for millions of tons of carbon dioxide. And they see it as a, a win for them to be able to um, get a uh, start to develop a, a constant supply of credits that they see they're going to need in the future.
And I thank you all very much for your um, participation. I see we're up to about 76 attendees. That's great.